Live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Hi, thank you for joining Inside Scoop. I'm Morgan Jameson. Today we're joined by Stephanie Eberhardt of Talent Remedy, and we're talking about job shortage, the lack thereof, or employment crisis. What is it? Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you and your audience today. Absolutely. Well, I think it's a very uh, timely topic, as you, uh, I'm sure, have seen in the, the news. Um, lots of uh, industries are claiming uh, job um, placement shortages, and I know that that's what you all specialize in. So can you first tell me a little bit about Talent Remedy and what you do and, and your take on uh, what's happening in the job market at the moment? Sure. Thanks so much, Morgan, for that opportunity. So I'm a managing partner and co-founder of Talent Remedy. We provide an hourly recruiting source um, service for companies to find full-time employees. And so our unique value proposition is that we typically save our clients somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of what they would pay in a direct hire fee, sometimes even more. So we are in the market all day, all night, the only service we provide is recruiting. So we have a pretty good idea of what is currently going on in the market, both in terms of jobs and also in terms of employees. And so at the moment, what we're seeing is now that vaccinations uh, have become available to the general public, that all of the companies that had held off in hiring in 2020 are currently trying to hire. Um, whether it's a small, medium size, or large organization, they have all turned on the spigots for hiring employees across all different types of sectors. And so what this is now creating is a employee shortage. Um, in addition, many of the folks who had uh, stayed in place during the pandemic had made the decision not to change jobs are now looking for new opportunities with different types of characteristics and benefits than what they had been looking for before. So essentially the pandemic has uh, created a wave of opportunities in terms of jobs, but it's also created a different mindset within the candidates and the empl future employees that are looking for new opportunities. Fantastic. So it sounds like there is a glut of opportunities, um, yet it might be a potential balance of um, interest. Are employers offering the right uh, incentive programs to uh, recruit people? Are, are you having to go back to any of your clients and say you might need to change what you're offering or what you're posting? That's a really, it's an excellent question because we, in fact, are having to do a lot of education about what we're hearing from future employees in the marketplace, as well as trends that we're seeing. And so with the pandemic, what we have seen is that um, technology is tremendously on the rise. Um, we have seen so much of a growth in the tech sector, and there is simply not enough talent in that sector. It isn't trained up enough to really do cross um, population between different sectors. So what we're encouraging uh, employers to do is really find talent that has the ability to learn quickly, is flexible, has a diverse background, um, and who can be taught those skills. But in terms of actual uh, you know, attraction to a company, why an employee would wanna work with an organization, we coach organizations on that. And we really do tell them that's who they have to be. Otherwise an employee will join them and realize very quickly that it's not the right organization for them. But one, one of the main uh, attractions besides pay, everybody wants to have a really healthy salary, but that isn't why employees stay in organizations. Um, it's really what's the mission, vision, and values of the organization. That is the most critical part of any organization. And every hiring manager, owner, key executive has got to be able to define that and then articulate it to the broad audience, not only new hires, but also to their current employees. So that's the number one thing. The second thing is with the pandemic, and we all you know, ended up working virtually, that um, a lot of employees now have the mindset that they want to work very independently. They don't mind being part of a team, but they also want to have the autonomy and the freedom to work the hours that they want to work on their schedule as long as they're being productive. And so this really is a shift in the thinking from the employer. Instead of just an eight to five or nine to six day, they really have to think, can this employee get 
the work done in the time that they want to get it done in, and it will serve our clients well. Uh, the third thing is also family and, and mental and physical health. So the pandemic obviously has caused stress um, on everybody's families and their relationships. And so employees are very concerned about whether they're going to be able to fulfill the commitments of the job and their family at the same time. And so we are encouraging employers to be flexible with this, to understand that if they need to take a couple hours off during the day, that that's OK. Or if they need to start their work day at 10 a.m. versus 8 a.m., again, once the, you know, they know what their responsibilities are and they can get the work done. That's what's most important. Um, and then, of course, the mental health and physical health is extremely important. We've all been under a lot of stress. We've all you know, had challenges um, in the past 15 months. And so we are encouraging employers to realize that and offer flexible hours, time off, um, you know, and really listen to their employees. If they're saying, I'm having a challenge, I need your support to really be there to understand that and to give them what they need to make them feel like they're valued and they're being heard. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing that. Um, something you mentioned is is encouraging uh, employers to be flexible. And I, I want to um, pull on that a little bit. Are you finding that employers are willing to articulate their company culture and embrace flexibility? And, and I ask this because a lot of what I have read and seen recently is my generation millennials and, you know, those after me, the, the zillennials or, or whatever they are, Gen Z. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm sure I will get that right at some point, but seems like a lot of people want more of that balance that you're talking about. So the question is, is two part. Are you seeing employers embrace that desire for change? And secondly, is that drive really coming from, uh, traditionally younger folks or is it coming from across the spectrum? Sure. That's, um, I'll answer both those questions. So, um, there are many generations in the marketplace right now. There's actually four, as you know, and that can be challenging because we all have been shaped by different events in the world, by the world that we live in, by the people that we associate with, by, you know, even by our upbringing. And so um, what I can share with you is that many of these folks, uh, not only in the Gen Z, Y, millennials, um, and then also baby boomers, they're really all looking for the same thing right now. The challenge is many of these senior leaders are the baby boomers, and they were brought up in very structured work environments. Um, I certainly think when educated and coached that they can make a shift the majority of the time, but they also have to learn that we are dealing with a different generation um, throughout uh, the bottom three levels. And I don't say bottom three as a negative. Um, I think we have some of the smartest generations out there in the workplace who can work faster than most of the boomers can work. So they're very impressive. But I think what it is, is it's a, it's a shift. It's a shift in thinking. And many companies would be served well to bring in a cultural coach who can help them define their culture and help them understand what employees are looking for and really make sure that senior leadership hears what they're looking for. Not just, yes, 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 we can do this, but really understands um, what future employees or current employees need. So that's okay. basically what I'm seeing uh, in the marketplace at the moment. That That's really insightful. Now, do you, do you find that those who are willing to um, embrace and, and truly find that understanding, uh, is there a correlation? I don't want to say causation, but is there a correlation between those who are willing to um, put the effort energy into embracing that mentality uh, in their success as a company or their success as hiring? I believe that there is a correlation because what I have seen with our own clients and with other organizations that I've studied is that when they invest in their culture and in the environment, not only just the physical environment, but the mental environment of their organization, that there is much more successful hiring. They tend to attract better talent. They tend to retain better talent because the employees feel like they're truly engaged in the organization. They're not just performing work and duties, but they're actually part of the organization and they feel valued. And I can't stress that word value enough because value doesn't always tie to monetary things or numbers of weeks of vacation or profit sharing. It, it ties to how you feel as a human being and how you're contributing. And so, you know, many of our, our lives have blended between work and, and home now. And so we want to be valued everywhere we go. And if you can truly make your employees feel like that, you don't have to be the highest paid employer out there. 
you're going to have employees that want to come to work, who are excited, who are engaged, and who truly want to work towards your mission. Absolutely. No. So on the other side of the coin, um, how are employers uh, approaching um, this need to to hire and fill jobs and, um, you know, how are they responding to these demands of, of cultural differences and, and everything else? So it's a, it's a mixed bag right now. Um, some just simply don't understand how we could have made such a quick shift. Um, and some say, yes, I see that we need to do those. Those are the more insightful ones who take the time to really get educated, whether it's through their own resources, they hire coaches, um, they talk to my, mind share groups or mastermind groups and learn about best practices. But those certainly seem to be the ones that are embracing it the most. Eventually, Morgan, I do believe everybody's going to have to understand that in order to hire the best talent. It isn't um, you know, a situation where they can you know, not focus on that because too many of the folks in the workplace, and again, it includes all four generations, are focused on quality of life. They definitely want to be key contributors to an organization, but they want to have that work-life balance. And when I say work-life balance, it's really important to understand. It doesn't mean you can't be a rock star at work. It just means that you also have to be able to manage your home life and feel good about both pieces of, of your day. Absolutely. No, I, I think that that's important to remember. Um, that's one of the company values where I work is, is work-life balance. Um, and we actually struggled on whether or not we were going to say work-life or life-work. We had um, mm, a conversation yes. on that uh, in terms of how we were going to, to phrase it. Um, so you mentioned that the IT sector is one in need and possibly um, finding people who can be fast learners. All too often in the workplace, we see entry level positions that are requiring five years of experience or, or more. And I'm sure you've seen that in the Absolutely. past. Is that something that is part of this cultural change that, that you are impressing upon um, potential hire, um, hiring um uh, those who are hiring, that's the word. <laughs> yes. So especially entry level positions, I mean, requiring five years of experience, in my opinion, is extreme, um, you know, especially for the folks that are coming out of, of universities or colleges today who are very well educated, not only in terms of studies, but in terms of technologies that are needed in the workplace today and really in working in a team environment. Much of today's learning done in our universities and colleges, this is really team learning. So they've already learned those skills um, in a structured environment, and I think they can adapt very easily to most workplaces. Um, so yes, I would say that, uh, you know, that it's really going to be important that these employers look at not only the fact that they have an education, um, but that they also just have the soft skills that are necessary to be successful in their environment. That's, that's great to hear that um, that is going hopefully by the wayside. <laughs> one, one question I, I ask for those who may or may not um, retain your services or, or those like yours, what are some good practices while hiring? One of the things that uh, Inside Scoop has been discussing recently has been systemic racism. So one thing that comes to mind is uh, removing names from from resumes before you review them. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some things that that you would recommend to those venturing out on their own while trying to hire? So you're talking about companies in particular, not employees yeah. looking, correct? Okay, correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think in order to prevent um, all types of um, you know in inequity within an organization in terms of hiring, there's a, there's a couple things you can do. I mean, you could certainly remove names, even though I will tell you that um, I'm hoping with what has happened in the last year in our country that we will all look past names without feeling like there's some type of prejudice there. Um, but awful, oftentimes, I definitely encourage removing dates, um, not necessarily of how long you've been in an organization, but definitely dates of education. And if it goes too far back, and I'm talking more particularly to the boomer generation, you know, take off some of the bottom jobs because really there's as much discrimination, in my personal opinion, going on not only for the senior generation, but also the junior generation. And so, you know, discrimination can happen in all forms, whether it's, you know, race, whether it's um, color, background, universities, discrimination on universities. You know, I oftentimes hiring, hear hiring managers say, I want to have somebody from my university. And, you know, I love the fact that they want their alumni, but at the same time, it may not be the best qualified individual. 
or they'll give me even in this day and age, I want somebody this age. And, you know, my response is, is always, we will send you the best qualified candidates that we can find available at this time. It's not about, uh, you know, their background or their name or how old they are. It really is. Do they have the skills to do the job and are they the right fit in terms of the culture and the organization? So um, the other thing I would say is, provide training, right? So ignorance is based on the fact that people are not exposed to multiple different types of facets of um, organizations and people that are out there. So I think ongoing education is critical in the workplace from every position that they have from the top to the bottom and back up. Um, and I think that's that's the way we help people is by educating them and making them aware of what really is in the workplace and what's in the world in general and making them uh, have an open mind. And you know maybe not everybody can do that, but I think the majority of the people will appreciate it and they'll certainly embrace it in the workforce. That's really great to hear that the, at least the work that you are doing is to find the, the best talent that is out there, regardless of any other contributing factors. So thank you for making that a priority for what you are doing. Well, thank you. Absolutely. I, I, I think it's important that people really do find that talent and, and find the best um, people for a, a position, regardless of that five plus years of experience. You might somebody have somebody who's doesn't have a college degree who might be the best suited because of their workplace history. Now, something you mentioned, um, I think isn't something that people oftentimes uh, think of. And I wanna pull on that string a little bit of age discrimination. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, having the year you graduated or you know the years you worked uh, certain jobs, what about that is indicative of potential age discrimination for too young or too old? So it really, I think that, um, as I mentioned, we've talked to folks in the past, um, and when I say folks, I mean pr prospects or even clients who want a, percent, a particular age group. And that in itself is discrimination, whether you want somebody who's 21 or you want someone who's 57, it's, it's discrimination. Um, and so what we do is we educate you know, our clients on you want the very best qualified employee for your organization. It doesn't matter what the age is. And I, you know, I almost feel like sometimes labeling our generations is discrimination because uh, people come to the table at times with preconceived, preconceived notions. And I think, you know, many millennials um, have heard, oh, millennials are hard to work with. Um, I don't believe that. I think they're an amazing generation. I think the challenge is that many of the boomers couldn't understand how to work with them. And so when you get out of your comfort zone, you consider it difficult. Instead of saying, you know, let's see, how can we make this be the most effective workplace? How can we maximize everybody's contribution? Um, it suddenly becomes difficult. So, you know, it's important to understand that inclusion and equity takes work. And it really should be a priority for all of us in all aspects of our life, not just in the workplace. But I think in the past year, we've really seen it come um, front and center in the workplace. And that's why it is such a hot topic today. And quite frankly, I hope it's a hot topic for the rest of our lives, because that's the only way that we're going to make sure that there is truly equity in the workplace in all segments across all sectors. I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Um, so are, are these uh, situations that it's not just on a printed resume, but, you know, or is there anything in a perspective employee should consider on maybe LinkedIn or otherwise? How do you find people and, and where are you looking and what are some bits of advice that you, you give to those who might be uh, out in the workforce that don't know that they're best suited for another potential job? So um, how we mostly find people, we, we look for passive candidates. We do, of course, have licenses to most of the major job boards and, and also to niche job boards in case one of our employers needs that. But really, we find them on LinkedIn. And I will tell you, LinkedIn is the number one database right now for professionals, and it has been for many years. The challenge is there's a lot of information on LinkedIn. So you can you know, spend a half an hour on it and really get very frustrated and not finding exactly what you're looking for. But um, I think LinkedIn is really important. I think it's important if you have a specialized skill to make sure that you're belonging to those associations and that you're, you're in the work databases for them, for prospective employers. Um, alumni 
it is a good place to do alumni databases. Even though I, I encourage employers not to just look at their alumni, I do think it's it's a mutual connection and people look for reasons to connect. Um, I also think just building your own network. I'm a huge fan of networks. I've never uh, received a job offer from outside, besides my first job, outside of a network, meaning that people have come to me and said, I've got an opportunity for you, or I know somebody you should speak to, um, you know, why don't you have a conversation? So networking is really important for yourself. Not, don't think of it just as building your business or um, working on your job. Think about what's your personal network, what's your professional network, and who are the people that you should be staying in touch with that really have their fingers on the pulse of what's going out on in the environment out there in the workplace and opportunities. So, um, you know, one of the things I would say about LinkedIn is make sure you have a great LinkedIn profile, a great picture. You explain exactly what you're doing. You list your skills, you list your background, you know, really invest in that because when people look at it, it's really, it's, it's like a resume for you if you're looking for a job for prospective employers. And the more impressive that is, then uh, the more likely they are to reach out to you, especially if they're seeking passive job seekers. Uh, with so many resumes in the marketplace from both passive um, job seekers and people that are currently unemployed, it's really hard for recruiters. You know, they've got a tough job. They only have eight hours in one day if they're working that work-life balance, which I encourage. Yeah. Um, they only have eight hours. And so, if you get, you know, 500 resumes for a job, they've got, you know, 30 seconds to scan over it and make sure it's the right opportunity, the right candidate for that opportunity. And so you may be missed. Um, one of the things I also encourage is if you're targeting uh, specific employers, that you'll actually go and do some research on that organization uh, through their website, through Glassdoor, the ratings on that organization, and then also through who are the hiring managers? And a lot of times you can find that out on LinkedIn and there's nothing wrong with reaching out to people directly, you know, be bold and be confident. They want to fill their positions and maybe they have a recruiter that's on the front line, but they'd love to hear from people, uh, well, prospective candidates that they feel could uh, join their organization and might be a good fit for them. Yeah, no, that's really solid advice for um, potential uh, employees. One thing I will mention is that headshot. Absolutely be sure that it is not a resaved image of a JPEG that is super pixelated because that is something that, um, you know, really can make or break. It doesn't have to be a professional headshot by any right. means, but something that is clear and concise. Um, you know, that is uh, something that that goes a long way. I really like what you're saying about being proud of your LinkedIn and, and you know, joining the right groups and um, participating mm -hmm. in networking. Um, you know, one way to kind of summarize that is what is somebody's personal brand, right? And what is it that they are trying to convey and how are they conveying it and whom are they conveying it to? Right. Um, and I think that that's important because you never know the opportunities. And, and I agree with you. There are many people out there who aren't active uh, searchers, but somebody in their network has said, here's an opportunity, I would like you to do this. Um, similar to me sitting here today on Inside Scoop, uh, our producer, Ben Zool, and I have known each other for a good while, and he said, here's an opportunity, I'd like you to consider this. Um, mm -hmm. And that wouldn't have come up in, unless we had maintained that relationship. So it's not just the, the notion of uh, who you know, it's, it's how well do you know them and how engaged are you with them? Um, exactly. So that's important. Now, when we get back from our break uh, here in a few minutes, I uh, just want to tease this out for people to stick around. We're going to dive a little bit deeper in terms of what the actual crisis is and if there is a crisis of uh, employees and employment and really dr drill into are people getting paid enough? Do they have enough um, resources and support to have those jobs and are employers willing to do the right thing? Currently, we've been joined by Stephanie Eberhardt of Talent Remedy, who has been a fantastic guest. Please come back after the break. Um, but before we get to the break, Stephanie, is there any parting words for those who might not be uh, sticking around and joining us that you really want them to hear from you today? Um, I think the last parting words for those folks that can't join us for the second half is just continue pr your professional um, development and growth in all aspects, skills, in terms of how you look at the workplace, 
um, and really do your research when you're looking for companies to work for, because there's some outstanding companies out there. But the most important thing um, for you is to remember that we do not live to work. We work to live. So find a job you're passionate about and that you can contribute and feel good about. Thank you, Stephanie. That's really fantastic. Hope you stick around for the break. And we really look forward to diving deeper into this discussion. As they head toward the finish, Warren has built a substantial lead and headed for her fourth gold medal. She's ahead of the world record pace by at least half a second. And she, oh, wait, wait, what's she doing? She, I think she's doing a headstand. Why would she do that? She's stopping. She just, she stopped. I've never seen she, she was so close like to the this. finish and she stopped. I, mean, this I don't is, know what she's this is unbelievable. STEM is the discipline of hard numbers, precise, no margin for error. Dare to forget that. Dare to have fun with it. Get weird with it. Dare to get messy or just mess it up. Dare to program something internet breaking, record breaking. Dare to blow their minds. Dare to try, dare to fail. Dare to keep daring. Dare to learn the difference between organic, sedimentary, and non-foliated metamorphic rock. Get outside, find those rocks. Dare to be homeroom famous, a high school fable. Dare to send those old STEM theories flying past the neighbor's house into outer space. And for the love of STEM, dare bigger. Dare to code, dare to invent, dare to explore, dare to STEM. Check out She Can STEM to get started. Freedom. It's at the core of who we are. The freedom to live without fear, to jog where we please, to wear a hoodie. The freedom to breathe. Before we celebrate the freedom most Americans have, we must fight for the freedom all Americans deserve. Because all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun? It's time for my monthly book club. It's an opportunity for us girls to connect and remind each other who's on mute. And this is how we have to meet. Because when we spend time indoors with people, we can still spread COVID faster than Nancy's gossip. That's why I'm still masking wherever I go. Because until I'm vaccinated, a mask helps slow the spread. Which means the sooner I can get back to a friend's house to judge their interior design. We can't hear you, Dolores. We're back to the inside scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Morgan Jamison. Today we're joined by Stephanie Eberhardt of Talent Remedy. We're talking about the job crisis or lack thereof here in the region. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Morgan. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. So in the first half, we were talking about uh, what employees, prospective employees could do better to um, position themselves and what employers could be doing better to attract folks. Now let's get into a little bit more of the meat and potatoes, if you will, of the actual um, job crisis or lack thereof. What is your opinion um, professionally on what is happening in the job market at the moment? So at the moment, there are, are a lot of companies, as I had mentioned in the first segment, um, who are hiring. And they had held off on hiring until the pandemic was over. And about end of Q1, right at the beginning of April of this year, is when we really see, saw the floodgates open up. And this is really across the majority of the sectors. So we're talking about IT, engineering, um, professional services, you know, government contractors, all types of categories. Logistics are really hot right now. But probably, Morgan, the very uh, top 
sector of hiring is in the healthcare industry. Um, not only physical, but mental health care. And there just simply are not enough workers for all the jobs that are out there currently. And what worries me the most about that is the fact that we cannot outsource health care. Um, that's one segment that really needs the human touch and needs people to be able to talk and relate and understand and comprehend what the need is. Um, in the IT and engineering sector, there's about three jobs to every one candidate at the moment. There are some organizations that can outsource their IT, um, not all of their IT, but some of it. Um, so there, that's a plus. Uh, the same goes for you know human resources or recruiting or uh, financial services or legal for that matter. Um, but nonetheless, there's a tremendous shortage um, of employees in America right now, despite the fact that in May of this year, the unemployment rate was 5.8%. Um, people always say, how can there not be enough employees? And the challenge is that there aren't enough employees with the right skills, education, background, and aptitude for the jobs that are available. And so it's really become a you know, a bidding war on candidates again, very much like what the real estate market is right now. That is what candidates are. So I can tell you that in IT, I've heard some significant increases for employees that I don't think I've ever heard before. Um, anywhere from $30,000 to $200,000 more than they were making. And so what is scary about that is I, I definitely encourage people to pay what's fair for the job that they're hiring for. But at the same time, um, you know, are we overcompensating and are we are we kind of shooting ourselves in the foot with expectations uh, in the marketplace that we may not be able to deliver? And especially to the smaller um, small business or to the small businesses, which make up the majority of the businesses in the United States. Now, Stephanie, to those who, who can't participate in a direct bidding war or the amenities arms race, if you will, what do you encourage um, potential employers to do um, to retain some of their top talent or attract um, uh, some talent that can't if they can't participate in that amenities arms race? So, yeah, that's that's a really good challenge that all these companies have and a good question. So what I will share with you is if you've got a key executive or someone who you know is going to be a main contributor to your organization, if you cannot pay what some of the larger organizations are paying, I would strongly encourage you to consider giving them some equity. And saying, you know, I'm willing to give you a piece of the organization for your contribution. Um, because then they truly do have ownership, uh, not only physically, but mentally. Um, and they are certainly invested. Now, I'm a true believer that any really devoted employee has that ownership anyway. I've, I've always believed that. But this is just another way to attract um, top talent if you cannot actually meet the salary. Um, the other investment that I encourage employers to always make is in professional development, not only in terms of you know, soft skills, management skills, communication skills, teamwork skills, but also in terms of uh, hard skills, you know, whether it's if it's in IT, is it coding, is it project management, you know, do you get your PMP, do you get certifications in certain types of categories? Or for organizations that don't have or, or categories that don't have those specific types of certifications, continuous development through seminars or through um, trainings that are ongoing. And so I believe in addition to a review, and I don't think reviews should just be annually. I think they have to be given on a quarterly basis. It doesn't have to be a sit down for three hours. It has to be, let's talk about what's been going on these last 90 days, that we should also have a plan, uh, an action plan for all of our employees in terms of their own development. And we should invest in that as organizations and also hold them accountable to it. So those would be a couple of the things that I would highly recommend. Now, what about those who say, if I'm investing, if I'm making this employee more valuable, do I have to pay them more or, or won't they leave to go find another job? What happens in, in those situations or, or what do you tell folks um, who have those objections? 
So um, I have heard that. And what I say is that the best investment you can make is in your employees. If you really want to grow your organization and have the highest quality service or product available. And so I don't think leaders should feel like they're going to be threatened that their employees are going to leave. I think that if they talk with their employees, they sit them down and say, you're valuable to me. I want to make this investment. These are my plans for you within the organization. And make sure that the employee really wants those plans, right? That They match up on the trajectory that this employer is considering for them and that they, you know, communicate that effectively. Everybody wants to feel like I had mentioned before, like they're valuable and they're contributing. So if the employer makes that very clear and sets out a plan, then I think that is a huge investment in itself. Um, and I think that's really important. So, I, I mean, that sounds like building opportunities for upward momentum and um, and really and truly saying, hey, this isn't happening tomorrow, but rather it's going to be, um, you know, down the road. This is the plan. I don't know when, but this is what I would like. I am curious to know, how does minimum wage affect the, the job market at the moment? So minimum wage does affect the job market because um you know, it, it's not it's not a lot of money. People certainly can't survive on it in most geographic locations in the United States. They either have to have, you know, a, a significant other or they have to have a living situation that um, is very, very affordable. And so during the pandemic, the challenge is that, you know, the unemployment actually paid more than minimum wage jobs. And with minimum wage jobs, we are creating a situation where, those folks don't want to stay in the minimum wage jobs. They want to go to higher paying jobs. So they're either you know, networking, they're increasing their skills, or they're finding other ways to get employment that are going to pay more. Um, so am I a proponent for, for lifting and raising the minimum wage? I absolutely am. I think that we need to offer people um, the opportunity to be able to live independently on the wages that they, they can earn. And absolutely, and, and live at a quality of life that people um, determine isn't just living or surviving, but, it, right. but you know, absolutely being there. So uh, to, to those jobs that were previously offering um, uh, minimum wage, may it be a, a moving company or a, um, you know, what's another industry, uh, fast food or other restaurants? Fast food, retail. Uh, right. What, what are Housekeeping, what, a lot of those jobs were, yeah. What are things that you would encourage beyond just, you know, paying more? Because obviously it's not just about salary, but salary is important, um, or at mm -hmm. least earnings. Let's not call it salary. Um, minimum wage is not traditionally a salary position. Right. Um, what are some ways that, uh, would it be the same things? Invest in the employees and let them know about the upward momentum opportunities? I think definitely always, I, I don't think, you know, whether you're making minimum wage or you're making, you know, a tremendous salary, I think investment's important. And if you're the business owner, then invest in yourself, you know, take the time to do that, make yourself the best leader that you can in an organization. But I think that, um, you know, time off is really valuable. I think you've seen a lot of companies, I've seen more in 2020 go to this where it's unlimited time off. And the reality is if you hire the right employees, they will manage their time off. They're not going to take six months off from work, but they're going to appreciate the fact that they've been given that opportunity to take time off when they want to take time off. Um, you know, general caring about people, you know, if they if they have a death in the family, giving them the time, even if it's past the bereavement period, understanding that if they need more than three days, they need to take more than three days. Um, being flexible to their style of, you know, life. Again, if you can, some of these minimum wage jobs are, are set hours, but if you can offer the flexibility or you can offer even a job sharing situation, I would recommend that as well. Um, and, you know, most importantly, just recognition for a job well done. A lot of times a cash bonus is nice. If you aren't able to pay well, but you can give cash bonuses for those types of positions, that's fantastic. Um, those are all really important. Fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing that insight. Um, we've talked a little bit about upward momentum and something that we have seen in the last um, several years, or at least I have um, noticed as a trend um, in my unofficial market research, has been this notion of um, lack of, of 
upward momentum past a certain point, not even mm -hmm. over a period of time, but past a certain point, somebody might um, do a quasi retirement and then uh, come back consulting, getting paid more and, and <laughs> holding up some of those those positions. What do you tell employers or employees when faced with those types of situations? So that really is a really good um, way to fill positions that there is not enough. There are not enough skilled employees in the marketplace for. Um, so I do encourage employers to consider what we call gig workers, um, workers who have retired from the marketplace or left the marketplace for whatever reason and are willing to do part time or even full time jobs on a 1099 basis. So these folks come to the table with the skills and the background that are needed and they're able able to um, add tremendous value to an organization right away. There's not a lot of training when it comes to rehiring these people or even finding those, you know, that are out there that can, can meet your needs. So I do believe that's a very viable way, especially with so many people retiring in the marketplace from the boomer generation that we're losing a lot of knowledge and a lot of senior expertise. This is one way of keeping it in the marketplace and retaining those folks. And what about looking within your current talent pool and um, possibly backfilling? Is that a, another popular option? That is an excellent option. So I do encourage employers as well, if they've got a you know a difficult position or something that's specific to their industry that some, they might already have somebody who has a lot of knowledge or training on, um, to really look at their current talent pool and say, can I make a shift for this person into a new position and backfill the other position? Um, I, I'm a firm believer if you can promote your own talent or provide more opportunity for it, they've already proven themselves. Go ahead and use the talent you have and then backfill with new talent and then help raise them as well. I think what you're going to find, too, though, is there's definitely org charts um, within organizations today and there's hierarchy, but more and more I'm seeing organizations really on a flat line where um, senior leadership is on the same level as everybody else. And I, I, I love that organization. I'll tell you why, because everybody feels like they can communicate, they can speak their mind, they can um, voice their opinions, that they're valued as much as someone who's been there, you know, for 20 years. And I love the fact that, that we can make people feel like they are, that they have purpose in the organization. And so I'm hoping that more employers will go to that in the future and understand it isn't about the title of your position. You know, I'm proud to be a co-founder and a managing partner, but the real the realization is I don't feel like my job is any more important than the recruiter that I sit next to or toward or the, you know, the the sourcing operator that I sit next to. I think that they're all very, very important positions. Everybody's role serves a function and a purpose, and without Absolutely. it, you wouldn't you wouldn't be carrying on. I really love that mentality. Now, Stephanie, um, <clears throat> if if you were to kind of switch your own career right now, if if you were to be a career counselor, um, mm -hmm. somebody who's looking to change their career or possibly go to school for the first time or uh, go back to school, or somebody who's looking at the job market. What are the top two or three things you would uh, give advice if they want to be um, the most attractive um, talent uh, that you're potentially sourcing? So I think that the couple of things I would recommend is make yourself as valuable as you possibly can to any organization that you join. So that means, you know, doing the, the work and learning about the industry and trends and um, what might be beneficial in the future? You know, what, what's the future going to look like in that organization or in that organization's, um, you know, the trends that are going to affect that organization in that particular sector of business? That's one thing. Always be educated and informed and in looking at the future. I think the second thing is, um, you know, I would encourage you to think, what do I really like to do? Because I, I know there's people that are not really passionate about their job. And fortunately, I love what I do. And so when I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up thinking, oh, gosh, I have to go to work. I am so excited about going to work. And I'm excited, so excited that I never really turn it off. And um, that's a wonderful way to feel. But I know there's many people that don't feel like that. So I say follow your passion and really do something that you love. Because I am a believer the money will come if you do it well. Um, there's a couple of, um, you know, different areas that are growing very quickly right now. Healthcare is one of them, as I mentioned before. If I was to make a shift right now, I would probably go into healthcare because there's a lot of opportunities in a lot of geographic locations across 
actually the entire world. Um, it's a skill that um, is helping other people. And um, there's a lot of training available for healthcare right now. So that would, would be one top one. You know, information technology is always hot. Uh, I think it will be for the rest of our lives simply because we are tied to our computers and our phones and, um, you know, our cars are becoming electric. And so what I would recommend is that if you have a passion for technology, that you invest in the schooling and in the certifications to make yourself the best you can be there. And then I think also um, another area that is going to be really popular is um, environmental, because everybody is concerned about the environment and, you know, how the population is, is affecting it and the temperatures and the trash and pollution and all of that. So if you're passionate about the environment, that's another area that's really strong to go into. That's all really great advice. And thank you for sharing. Is there anything that the pandemic has done um, regarding the workplace or, or even not pandemic? What are, what are some of the um, trends that people might not know um, that are really going to impact uh, the, the industry that is jobs uh, in, a, in a big way? So I think, you know, the, uh, probably most people have heard this, but the biggest trend is going to be um, going back into the workplace and having a uh, split schedule. When I say that, I mean split in terms of two days on, you know, three days at home or, you know, four days in the at home, one day in the office. I think that what's going to be really important is that we're able to communicate effectively and efficient, efficiently through video and other uh, technology mediums. I think it's going to be important to be a team player and still a team even though we're not all going to be sitting in a, one particular office together. And I think that, um, you know, it's going to be really important, uh, the camaraderie within the organization. So there's been a lot of interesting uh, takeouts from this pandemic. You know, I've seen companies do happy hour wine tastings. I've se seen them play trivia games. I've seen them um, host, you know, what favorite pet parties I've seen them host things like bring your kid to day or to work day. And, you know, you have your child next to you on one monitor and you're on this monitor, but things that just kind of take a break from the, the, the normal um, workplace and work day and allow us to have some fun and some insight into who we are as people and, you know, really what motivates us, what we're proud of and um, what makes us get up every day and want to go into the office whether it's in your living room, your office, or a physical building that the company owns. Absolutely. That's, I mean, really great company culture, really great opportunity to uh, to get people where they are and, and how they are doing. Um, any fun stats that that you or your industry might be aware of that, that other people might not be thinking of when it comes to um, comes to uh, work in, in job opportunities. Sure, so well, there is a big opportunity coming up. Um, you know, with the pandemic, we have to look at what, what's positive about the pandemic. And one of the positive things is that many of the folks are retiring early. And I see that as a positive because they're able to live out the next chapter of their life earlier than they had anticipated and, and start having a lot of fun, hopefully. Um, but what that means is that there's gonna be more opportunity for people to move into senior roles um, or just to roles in general. So it's expected that 2.7 million Americans will retire early because of the pandemic. That's quite a few jobs. Um, so there is tremendous opportunity and I can see that as a positive. That's really opportunity for other people and a whole lot of fun, hopefully for those retirees. Um, the other opportunity is in the IT and engineering sector where there's currently three positions to every employee. Um, especially what's hot is cybersecurity. And I think, you know, we're hearing daily about data breaches and ransoms and, you know, just how important it is to have really good security on your systems. And that's an area that you don't need a college degree. You, you can go get a couple of certifications and learn that and be very valuable to an organization. And that is also um, a sector that will continue to train their people because technology is always changing. So they have to stay up on the time. So that I see is very much a positive. Um, 
And then there's a lot of other types of jobs too. the Morgan, you know, there's, you know, HVAC tax, there's car mechanics, there's, um, you know, retail managers. And those organizations also are taking people in that have good aptitude and training them up on the job, which is, again, another tremendous opportunity. Absolutely. So I've got my producer in my ear saying it's it's a little too late for some boomers to be retiring <laughs> early. I just want to say, you know, it depends on when you want to when you want to get out of the the system. And, uh, you know, are you going to be doing Social Security? Or are you not at, at what point? Um, right. But, uh, you know, that that is a significant uh, number of positions. And you know, it almost makes me wonder and almost concerned, are we ready? Do you think that we, the public, are ready? Are there enough job seekers or qualified um, job seekers to fill those roles? Will those roles, um, you know, be combined with other roles? Do we have the, the talent here to make that happen? So I don't think we have enough talent in our country to make that happen. And so I do encourage organizations to go worldwide if they can. And, um, you know, certainly I want to employ Americans, but I also realize that some of those skills and those um, technologies that are needed, we don't have enough people in the United States that are trained on those. And so I do think that it'd be great to, you know, cross the oceans and go to other countries and really get that diverse talent um, and that know-how and knowledge. And that would really be the ideal situation is having people from all over the world collaborating together, you know, different cultures. So I would encourage that. I think that, um, you know, we're going to have to learn to be smart in how we work. And what that means is that some jobs will be eliminated uh, with technology and people are always very fearful of that. However, the reality is let's take those people and retrain them in other jobs that they uh, that, that are really highly needed and that need that human touch. Um, and never be afraid to grow them bigger than where they are today. You know, we, as I said, I keep going back to we want our folks to be the best that they possibly can be, no matter what position they're in. So growing talent is really, really important. And so I, th I do think that we, we are in, we're going to have a serious crisis shortly. I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. Um, but I do think that, you know, we have to be smart about about what we do. Um I also go back to outsourcing. Outsourcing is a great way for organizations to not have that talent in-house, still have it, the work done affordably, but at the same time, um, you know, use the resources that they have on their core business and their priorities. Absolutely. You heard it here for, first on Inside Scoop, folks. Take your company and be international. That's what I'm hearing from uh, Stephanie Everhart today. Um, Stephanie, what are some of the services available out there to make workplaces uh, more worker more worker friendly? So some of the services that are currently available, obviously coaching, you know, uh, there's a lot of organizations that coach on company culture, um, whether it's an individual or it's actually a, um, you know, a team of uh, professionals that come in and, and teach you how to be the best uh high functioning organization that you can be with your keeping your mission and vision in, intact. Um, there are team building organizations that help you learn how to work better as employees together. There are also um, wonderful assessments. I'm a big fan of assessments because I think that they do, in fact, tell you a lot about a person's aptitude as well as their preferences. And sometimes when we go to work, we put on what I call um, a show and I, it's never intentional, I don't think. But I think we think we feel have to, we have to show up a certain way, but that really may be in conflict with who our inner self is. And so for that reason, I think it really is important to understand who your employees are and assessments help you understand that. Um, and it's the best, you know, it's good for the employee and it's good for the employer. So those are those, those are probably three of the top things I would say. Fantastic. Now, Stephanie, if somebody wants to learn more about you or some of those resources that you might know, how can they contact you? And could you please remind our viewers what it is that you specialize in? Sure. Thanks so much, Morgan. So again, I'm Stephanie Eberhard. I'm the managing partner and co-founder of Talent Remedy. And we are a recruiting firm that helps commercial businesses, nonprofits, and government contractors find full-time talent affordably. 
So our unique value proposition is we typically save our clients 40 to 60% of what they would pay in a 20% direct hire fee. And we also very heavily focus on culture and mission and vision and values in addition to the skills that are needed for the job and the experience. Um, if you want to contact me, I'm happy to take um, an email. If you send me an email, I'm happy to set up a conversation. My email is seberhart at talentremedy.com. Or if you go to talentremedy.com, you can also reach me through that. So thank you, Morgan. Absolutely. No, I want to make sure that people know where they can turn if they want this uh, direct uh, insight and information. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about how to make a enriching life for the employee. And you also mentioned that 2.3 million people are set for retirement. 2.7. Um, 2.7. My apologies. Thanks for yeah. correcting me. And we've also talked about um, upward mobility. Do you think that with some of these people retiring, that some of the folks who might be filling those roles might be more apt to embrace the notion of company culture, not just saying it on paper, but actually embracing it and, and living it? I do. I do believe that that is becoming um, and has become uh, a tr tremendous need for a lot of folks out there, especially in the interview process. So I will tell you the other day I was talking to somebody about a, a position and they said to me, well, what does the company do in terms of social responsibility? And that was the first question they asked me prior to ask me how much money were they going to make? What was the job worth? What were the benefits? And I think people are, are seeking purpose um, and they want to be part of a bigger purpose than just going and making a living or you know performing a function. They want to really uh, be part of a, a culture that is engaged in the community. Um, and I think that they're going to be looking at that. They're going to be definitely looking at diversity and inclusion. And I think Many people can say those words, but they don't really understand what they mean. Um, and, and basically, it's taking labels off of everything. And it's seeing the world, um, you know, without colors and without um, preconceived notions and without, um, you know, thoughts that, that maybe we grew up with that were wrong. Um, and that's going to be really, you know, hard for some employers to make that shift. I mean, it really is all about awareness and the willing to change and embrace and not just talking it, but living it, living it through actions, living it through the people that you hire, um, living it through, uh, you know, your contributions to the community and to, and to your, to your individual employees as well. Absolutely. That's that's fantastic. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, Stephanie. I've really appreciated you joining us today. Um, I would love to have you back at, at some point to share some of uh, this information as it continues to develop the uh, workplace trends. As you know, Fairfax County is one of the most diverse counties in America. And I think that we also have one of the most educated counties in America yeah. in the sense that people are, are curious about what is happening in the world around them. And you definitely have a pulse on a very unique uh, niche of, of what impacts all of us day to day. So thank you so much for joining and sharing that with us. Well, Morgan, I, really I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity it. to come on and to share information about that. And I hope, you know, that what I've shared has been valuable and I am proud of you for, for, making this um, top of mind to folks out there, not only what the market looks like, but how employees can look for the best job for them, but also about the fact that, you know, each one of us has to take responsibility and contribute to our community and to the world as a whole. And we spend the majority of our time in the workplace, so we might as well start there and really make that the, the healthiest place we spend most of our day in. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here again. I'm Morgan Jamison, your host of Inside Scoop. Check us out next time.